all of my heart. But there's someone who has torn it apart, and she's taken just all that I had. If you wanna try to love again, well, baby, I'll try to love again, but I know. Me? Now you can hear me. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back. <laughs> Some of y'all. Uh, who was here yesterday? Can you raise your hand? Oh, very good. And who are the new people? Raise your hand. Is this your first day here? Okay, great. We'll be expecting some more people later on. Um, I just want to welcome you to day two of the Curve LBA Wound Conference. I hope you enjoyed yesterday's presentation. And it was really great. We had some great uh, speakers yesterday, and we have more great speakers uh, scheduled for today. Uh, I just want to go over a few uh, reminders with you. Uh, please turn down your cell phone or pagers. Uh, the restrooms are located directly behind us, behind the double door on the right-hand side. Um, please make sure that if you haven't signed in already, to please sign again, even if you were here yesterday. Has anybody not signed in? Please sign in the back. Um, lunch will be provided today, so if we don't have your signature, then we don't have the proper account to catch everybody, okay? Um, you should have the evaluation form with you as well in front of you. If you do not have one, please raise your hand and we'll get one to you. Uh, this is necessary for the TNA certificate, so you need to turn this in at the conclusion of the program to get your certificate. Also, you should have a survey in front of you. If you completed one yesterday, then you don't have to do it again. But if you never completed one, please do so, because this helps with the grant to get uh, programs um, available like this. So please make sure you fill this out. And all the information is private, so it won't be shared with anybody else. Uh, let's see. Uh, also note the disclosure that's posted on your table. Uh, everybody's read it and seen it, correct? Uh, we want to th also thank our sponsors, um, some of our sponsors, for uh, providing the refreshments today. And um, I believe they're going to be bringing some donuts later on. Okay. And if you didn't know, today is Donut Day, so we can celebrate that, right? <laughs> and then the Spurs won last night. Yay! Yay! <laughs> and I just heard that they don't provide free coffee here at Kerrville at Valero, but we're providing free coffee for them. So. <laughs> Okay, I'd like to introduce our first speaker today. Her name is Lisa Johnson. She's our clinical dietitian for community living centers and home-based primary care here. Uh, she re received her Master of Science in Nutrition in 1984. As a clinical dietitian, she has cared for community living and homebound individuals to ensure nutritional needs for healing wounds. And she's had 30 years experience in a variety of healthcare settings. She is also a certified diabetic educator having worked on the VA diabetes, diabetes trial and also a certified specialist in gerontological nutrition. So please help me extend a warm welcome to Lisa Johnson. Thank you. You all have a, a good group this morning. Um, I, I work here at the Kerrville VA and so a lot of your faces are familiar. Um, but I understand from Sue that we have a, a variety of people from here in Kerrville, from Audie, and also some from the community. So my talk will, will be, it won't be focused necessarily on the VA, but I will be bringing up some of the points and, and some of the barriers and the things that we have available through the VA for wound healing. Um, I, uh, my talk today is going to focus on, on nutrition for wound healing. What I usually always teach is that, the, you know, for wound healing, there's three main factors. There's the, uh, the, the wound care is extremely important in healing. There's the relief of pressure and then also the nutritional factors. And so without any one of those points, the, uh, the ability to heal wounds um, isn't present. So, um, you know, nutrition is, is an important factor and we can't uh, ignore it. Um, I hope today that we, you know, learn more about the macronutrients, the micronutrients, and 
then that you'd be able to identify the nutritional factors for healing. Uh, some of the, the, the risk factors are, would, would include weight loss. Now, um, actually, it's a 5% change in 30 days, and these are pretty much standard uh, assessment tools. A 5% change in 30 days or a 10% in six months. Um, this is what we use for all our MDS indicators, and pretty much it's a significant change if it meets that criteria. We dietitians tend to be a little bit more fastidious and we go down to 4.5% in 30 days and so you know we look at those factors. Uh, but if you've seen a weight loss in, in recent times then you would want to make them at, at higher risk of having pressure ulcers. Also if they have any problems with undernutrition, um, we're going to talk more later about different um, lab tests for nutrition and how, um, how reliable those are and in what types of settings they would be reliable. Um, and then also, um, we want to identify factors where, where people might be um, more able, you know, their, their ability to prevent a skin breakdown from occurring um, may be less. And some of those would include the uh, protein energy malnutrition, dehydration, and also if they have a low BMI, below 22. Now, um, it pretty much, you know, we always focused on the undernutrition, the people that were too thin, the people that lost too much weight. And now we're kind of having an opposite end of the spectrum. We're having people that that are way too much, um, that they're gaining too much weight. So we have to consider those factors also. And uh, in, a, in a lot of cases I see in the clinical setting where um, the needs of the obese are ignored because they're obese, we don't really have to worry about their nutrition. Um, and in many cases they could be much more undernourished um, despite their weight than people who are thinner. So we still need to look at the nutrition for people that are obese also. And I'll kind of go into the differences as we come across those. Um, but just be really careful for, um, you know, not just dismissing people that are obese that their nutrition is fine because they still have a lot of needs. Um, and if you think about it, the additional weight that's placed on the bony prominences and things like that increases their risk of pressure ulcer formation. So, um, okay, the, the causes of nutrition-related risk factors um, are quite a, quite a number of them. And one of them would be if they rely on somebody else to feed them. Um, in many cases, the, the um, identifying the increased need and receiving the assistance to eat is there's a lag time between the need for assistance. So uh, just, and, and, and often it's the people that are closest to the individual that are slowest to identify the increased risk. So we have to get away from, yes, they can feed themselves, yes, they can feed themselves. Um, well, maybe they've lost that ability, but since we've always pegged them as a self-feeder, it takes us a while and some weight loss often before we identify them as having increased needs and actually giving them the, the assistance so that they can eat the enough of their food so that they can prevent nutritional problems. So just be careful of that. I see that frequently both in the home setting. Um, uh, here at the VA I work in the, in the CLCs and I also do home-based primary care. So I visit the homebound veterans and it's, uh, you know, the family will say, oh, he can feed himself, he's just being lazy. Well, when you really look at it, their ability to get the hand from the plate to the mouth is really diminished. And unfortunately, I see that in the CLCs too, where the staff just is used to them being able to feed themselves. So really kind of, um, you know, reassess on a regular basis instead of slotting them into the independent um, or the just need assistance was set up a category. 
Um, also, there's a lot of problems with chewing or swallowing problems. Um, obviously, if they can't chew meat, um, they're not going to be able to get the protein that they need, so we need to look into that. Some uh, often telltale signs are if they're chewing um, and spitting out wads of food on the side of their plate. Um, that's something that the dietitian can pick up by doing meal rounds, or you can let the, the unit dietitian know if you're in a healthcare setting, or if you ask um, the family the patient if they're having any difficulty chewing. A lot of times the, the patient themselves won't really let you know because it's kind of a modesty issue, but you can kind of tell by looking at their teeth if they have um, really um, poor dentition, it's pretty obvious when you're interviewing them. Um, but if you do a dental exam, you know, just ask them to open their mouth, you can kind of see that they're missing a lot of the molars and uh, look into more whether they're able to chew or not. And then give some suggestions on um, softer meats, you know, grinding the meats, some different ways that they can get some protein in. Um, also, you know, if you're in the, the, the setting where you have the ability to revert, refer to the dental clinic, um, that would be a good referral. Uh, here in the CLCs, I know just recently our, our dentists are evaluating everybody and seeing them uh, and treating them, which is really wonderful that um, their dental needs are getting taken care of. Um, and also for swallowing problems, we really need to, uh, to use our ancillary um, staff, you know, Nursing needs to refer to the dietitian and then also to speech therapy, occupational therapy, so that we can um, assist in providing or identifying people that have more difficulty swallowing, which the speech therapist could help us with. And also the speech therapist is really good at, at identifying what would, might be the best consistency of diet for the individual. So, they might recommend that they go from a regular to a mechanical or even pureed and then also the consistency of liquids so that they can swallow and process their foods more effectively. The other person to, to think of is the occupational therapist because like in the first one with increased dependence on others for eating, if, if we um, get some special equipment or if the occupational therapist could work with them on on um, skills for feeding themselves, you know, whether it be special um, utensils or cups or something like that where they actually get more of the food in, that's beneficial. So we need to use our, our therapists in those areas. Dementias also can, can contribute to nutrition-related risk if they forget to eat in the home setting, if they're living by themselves, um, if they suddenly become, along with the, the dementia, paranoid where they think somebody's poisoning them, therefore they're not accepting food. Uh, advanced age, uh, there's a lot of factors that come along with advanced age. Their ability to prepare, to, um, to get groceries, to get to the grocery store, and then usually they're, they're, they don't have the ability to really stand and cook and prepare things like they did in the past. Uh, restricted diets, this is something that we're really uh, striving to uh, minimize. Uh, the restricted diets really tend to prevent people from eating. And in order to re-nourish people or prevent malnutrition, you have to have the food actually go into the mouth and into the body. So you can give them the picture perfect low calorie, low fat, low cholesterol, low sodium diet, but if they're not going to eat it, it's not going to do any good whatsoever. So we really need to get the diet, um, the re real restrictive diet orders minimized in order for the, the person to actually ingest the food. Uh, poor appetite, this could be for a number of reasons, whether they're sick, whether they have so much pain from their sores, um, you know, if they just had a surgery and um, you know, they're 
uh, you know, in the hospital setting, they're in an unknown area, they're getting foods they're not used to, there can be all kinds of reasons for poor appetite. And we kind of need to work through those and identify what might be the cause and try to work with those factors. And then hypermetabolism, such as fever, infection, anything that's causing more output, and we need to make sure we're putting in enough to compensate for that. And, and then also cachexia, and then NPO, we need to watch out for, and I think we're pretty good with that these days, um, but if somebody, say for an example, has an ileus, well we can't just put them on a clear liquid for two weeks and forget about them. We really need to have a cutoff point, and usually, three days is a good, you know, if they're MPO more than three days, we really need to look into an alternative means of feeding them in order to get their nutrition in. Um, and then also clear liquids after three days. Now, if they're getting some something in, like the clear liquids, we can frequently advance to a full liquid. Um, and then there also are some supplements that provide a lot more nutrition, even in the full, uh, the clear liquid area. But just involve your dietitian. Sometimes they are, they're not aware that somebody has a problem and they can intervene and, and add some extra things in. Um, as far as the biochemical measures, there's really no lab test that really tells exactly whether somebody's nourished or not nourished in the hospital setting. Unfortunately, the albumin and the prealbumin are not really good indicators of nutritional status because they're so influenced by other factors, such as um, the first phase response. So if somebody has an infection, then the albumin is going to be low because they're fighting an infection. And it's not necessarily because they're malnourished. Now, um, the prealbumin is more a more sensitive indicator than the albumin. Um, the half-life of the albumin is about two weeks. So if you're making changes, it'll take about two weeks to see from a nutrition standpoint in the albumin. Um, but the prealbumin is more sensitive and it only takes about two to three days to see a change. As long as there's not inter inter intervening uh, factors like inflammation, infection, surgery, <laughs> fluid overload, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, um, I guess this has always been a frustrating thing for me because it's like, okay, you can't just blanketly say albumin and prealbumin aren't a good indicator. You have to look at some form of indicator. So you have to look at the albumin, you have to look at the prealbumin, but you have to look, okay, is that low because, you know, obviously if they have three plus edema in their legs or if they're in congestive heart failure, then you know it's fluid that's causing that. If they're just post-surgery, then it's more of an acute first phase response. But if you draw a CRP level along with the prealbumin, um, and if the CRP level's within normal limits, then you're more reassured that the prealbumin is giving you a good indicator. So the CRP level indicates inflammation. And so if it's high, then the albumin the prealbumin not being within normal limits is probably due to non-nutritional factors. And then often, especially with liver disease, you're never going to see a normal prealbumin or albumin. It's always going to be low. And then frequently with, uh, with inflammation, like if they have chronic rheumatoid arthritis and those types of factors also. So albumin and prealbumin, um, we draw them, we look at them, but they might or might not be an indicator of nutrition. And it's kind of frustrating because it's like, what is? And there really isn't a good lab test that will tell us all the time. So uh, instead of just dismissing the albumin and the prealbumin, to me it means to me that I need to dig deeper. I need to really look at how much they're taking in. Because if they're taking in um, 80, 100 grams of protein a day, then probably it's not malnutrition that's causing the low albumin or prealbumin. But if, um, you know, if I do a, a history of how, what they've been eating and they're really not eating a good amount of protein, then it, it very likely could be the cause. Okay, so nutritional requirements for wound healing. Um, 
we really want to intervene early or we want to you know try to prevent malnutrition and so we want to try to keep them as well nourished as possible um, and you know just like just like the triangle you know we want to prevent too much pressure for too long um, you know we want to uh, make sure that they have proper nutrition so that they don't get into a nutrition decline where they're at more risk for skin breakdown. So research has shown that early nutritional intervention leads to improved healing of surgical wounds. And then uh, if you give nutritional supplements, um, that it helps prevent also. But we, we really want to try to get the nutrients we need from food as much, as much as possible as opposed to providing supplements and using those instead of food. Now if people really can't eat or aren't going to eat, um, then we do want to, to target the supplements and we'll go through some of the ways that we can or cannot do that in the VA system. Um, there's a 25% reduction, reduction in pressure ulcer development by giving the oral or enteral supplementation. Um, but they really, uh, and a lot, of, a lot of studies have shown that by giving proper nutrition that the wounds do heal faster, but really as far as how fast is to be seen. Um, it's always been amazing to me in, in um, my experience of how many calories it actually takes to heal a wound. Um, and when you're when you have somebody in a long-term care setting and they're on a tube feeding, you can much easier see what's going in versus you know how something is healing. And I have, I've actually had 80-pound little ladies that are in their 90s that require 25 to 3,000 calories a day in order to see the you know the really improvement in the healing of the stage four. And it's amazing that. You know, you're plugging along, you're giving, you know, you keep increasing the amount of tube feedings as they tolerate, and, um, and then you start seeing the improvement in the wound, and once that wound heals, boom, they start putting on weight like crazy. But really, the albumin and the prealbumin won't get better until that wound is almost healed. So if you're doing constant, you know, albumin, prealbumin levels, it's going to stay low as long as the wound is bad. So if they have a bad wound, it's kind of a given that the albumin and the al prealbumin are going to be low, just because of infection of you know problems with the wound. So um, if if you have somebody who has a bad wound and they start gaining weight, then that's kind of you know usually you'll see a really improvement in the wound and the wound is really on the verges of healing. But um, there's there's lots of uh, recommendations for what to do for nutrition, but it's really more of a trial and error. All the stuff that I'm going to give you on ballpark figures on how many calories, how much protein, how much water, that's an educated guess that we start with. And then clinically we go from there. If we put them on 30 calories per kilogram and no healing is happening, we need to do something different. If we're giving them X amount of protein then and nothing's happening, we need to do something different from a nutrition standpoint and then obviously from a pressure relief and from a wound care standpoint. So, you know, again, it's the, the triad of, of, of healing. We have to look at all areas. So um, just keep that in mind that everything is... Um, is a you know kind of guesswork on what will work and what will won't work in an individual because everybody is made up differently but energy is necessary so we have to make sure that they're getting enough energy or the protein isn't going to help at all so uh, energy is necessary for anabolism nitrogen synthesis collagen formation and wound healing and then of course glucose is our major source of energy so um, I'm sorry, uh, you know, people that are really anti-carb people, but we have to have some carbs for healing. And um, this is where we really want to get away from any um, type of special diet like low carb and things like that. And, and when they have a wound, we, we want to make sure they're getting adequate calories. So if somebody is obese, 
we're not working on weight loss, we're working on wound healing. Now our goal should be possibly that they don't gain weight, but not necessarily that they lose weight during the period of healing. Um, but our first focus is on healing the wound. And then according to the ASPEN, which is the American Society of Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition, um, we want to make sure that we're giving at least 30 to 35 kilocalories per kilogram. And that's something the dietitian can figure up. And, and if you look at our assessment notes, it's always in there. So um, it's pretty easy to calculate. And then if there, somebody's underweight, we go up to 40 calories per kilogram. And then if we're giving that, and we know they're getting that, and they're not gaining weight, and the wound's not improving, we'll even go up from there. But then if somebody is obese, we may go down to, say, 25 to 30 range on kilocalories per kilogram in order to prevent weight gain in those areas. And then there's also, like I'll talk about later, there's some things we can use that would be higher in protein that would give more nutrition with fewer calories. And then the, the, um, the, the body that does a lot of the uh, recommendations is the NPUAP and that's the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel, and they're the ones who have all the recommendations. Um, and then as far as protein is concerned, it's essential for synthesis of enzymes involved in wound healing, in all the connective tissue and making a positive nitrogen balance. Protein is essential in wound healing. So you have to have the energy, but you have to have the protein. And if you don't have enough energy, the body is can going to convert protein into energy. So you're going to have all the waste products of that conversion and you're not going to have the use of the protein for building, rebuilding tissue. So you have to make sure there's enough calories and then enough protein for healing. Um, and then as far as how much protein is necessary depends on the type of wound. If they have a stage one, um, not so much. If they have a three or a four, much more. If there's lots of drainage, um, then even more protein is needed for healing. So, um, and then as far as protein, oops, as far as um, protein needs go, uh, the general population needs about 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram. And again, the dietitians calculate all this and it's in their notes. Um, but the elderly need a little bit more, they found. Um, in the last couple of years, you've heard of sarcopenia, which is the loss of protein or muscle mass in aging. They found that the elderly really need uh, about one gram per kilogram or 1.2. And so um, when, you know, a lot of the people that we treat for wounds do tend to be a little bit older. And so we want to make sure that they're getting their protein needs. Now, if they have a wound on top of that, then it goes up from there. It could be anywhere between uh, 1.25 grams per kilogram or even up to 2 based on the, on the wound and how depleted the person is. Now, we really try not to go above 2 grams per kilogram um, because then it results in dehydration. But you really want to prevent too much protein because again you're going to be converting protein into calories if you give too much protein. Um, sometimes I see um, where some people are a little overzealous and they give way too much protein. Um, especially it can be done in the tube fed person because the formula is providing so much and if we give too much additional then we can really put them at risk for dehydration. So you really need to make sure enough water is going in on a tube fed person in order to prevent that. And also, um, you know, somebody who is bed bound, in, whether they be at home or in the clinical setting, if they can't access or if, if they can't bring the cup from the table to their mouth, they, somebody needs to be, you know, making sure that they're getting their fluid needs on a regular basis. Okay, and then um, there's special amino acids that are being used for wound healing. The arginine is uh, the first one we're going to talk about. And um, these are not widely available at the VA. They're not on the, I just checked again this morning to see what was formulary and not because it changes on a regular basis. But 
Arginine is available as an injection, but it's not formulary. Um, so that would be more used in, um, you know, ICU settings and things like that. Um, it is a semi-essential amino acid. It supports blood flow, and it's a building block for proteins, which can contribute to healing. But there's not a lot, it's not, um, it's not something that there's enough research behind that it's a tried and true, we're gonna make sure we have it type of a thing. So um, the next one, okay, well the, the arginine, um, it is an amino acid and it's found in tube feeding. So anybody that's on a, a tube feeding, it would be found in the formula. And um, in, in quantities up to 18.7 um, grams per liter. And most of the studies on wound healing have given more than that. So, uh, again, the, the studies have been inconclusive on some of them show that arginine is very helpful in wound healing, and some of them haven't really shown that much of a benefit. But I know the people who made the arginine are really recommending the use of their products. Um, clinically, I have seen some benefits in use of the arginine and the, the glutamine. So, you know, it's something that if you're doing all the normal things that are available in formulary and you're not seeing a change in the wound, that's something that you could talk to the dietitian and we can look into that a little bit further. Um, the next one would be the glutamine. And um, it also plays a role in collagen production and supports the nitrogen balance. Um, it, uh, its safe dose is about um, 0.57 grams per kilogram of body weight and um, in a lot of studies it hasn't shown to improve wound healing. Now Juven, which is a product that, um, that has both arginine and glutamine in it, um, is promoted for wound healing. And and um, glutamine just by itself is not available on the, on the formulary for the VA, whether it be formulary or non-formulary. Now, um, in some cases, Juven is available through Nutrition and Food Service if it is a uh, inpatient, but it is not available on the outpatient setting at the VA. So um, you might need to look at that a little bit more. Uh, the next nutrient would be water. So we need to make sure that they're getting enough water because it's necessary to have healthy tissue. And um, if, if they become dehydrated, that's a risk factor for skin breakdown. We also need the water to make sure that the nutrients are flowing through the tissue. So we wanna make sure they're getting at least 30 milliliters per kilogram. And again, that's something that the dietitian will calculate for you. And in some cases, if they're having a lot of loss of fluid through the wound, or if they're having diarrhea, then they would need more fluids. Um, we want to prevent fluid restrictions as much as possible, but if they are ordered or necessary, then we don't really want to go below 1.5 liters. Um, it's, they just need the, the fluid for wound healing. And then as far as vitamins and minerals are concerned, we want to go with a standard multivitamin. Um, there's lots of, it used to be there was kind of a cocktail always recommended if somebody had a wound, they'd get a multivitamin, um, zinc, 2, 220, BID, vitamin C, 500 BID, and they'd be on that forever um, or months after the wound healed. And now they're, they're not recommending that anymore. Um, they're, they're, they, the research has shown that unless you suspect a deficiency, um, that the supplementation isn't necessarily beneficial. But then again, there's not necessarily lab tests that tell us if they have a deficiency or not. So if it's somebody who hasn't been on supplementation, um, and has some of the risk factors that we'll go into in a minute, 
uh, you might want to do a supplementation. And then just putting somebody on a general multivitamin isn't a bad idea for wound healing. But if you give zinc for a long time in high doses, it can cause a copper deficiency. So we want to be careful of that. Um, vitamin C is essential for tissue repair and regeneration. Um, without vitamin C, we see a prolonged wound healing. So uh, it is definitely necessary. But whether it makes a difference in wound healing is based on whether they're deficient or not. Um, so if you're going to supplement, what's recommended is a dose of 500 to 1,000 milligrams a day. And then usually the supplementation would go for 14 days. Now if it's somebody who has a stage 4 and it's going to take you months and months to heal it, you might want to do a 14 day course now and then reassess at another time and maybe do another 14 day course. But it wouldn't necessarily be, you know, a vitamin C for the entire duration of the, the wound care. So you need to look into that a little bit more. Um, you have to watch out for the, the oxalate stone formation um, that can occur if you give the supplemental vitamin C. And then in renal patients, you wouldn't want to give the 500 milligrams. You'd want to give about 100. And usually that's found in the renal vitamins that they, if they're on a renal vitamin. Um, the next uh, nutrient for wound healing would be the zinc. And that's essential in uh, proper immune, immune function, collagen synthesis, and wound healing. And um, if, if there's a lot of drainage with the wound, then that could cause more leakage of the, the zinc. And if you're going to supplement, if you suspect a deficiency, then you would want to supplement. And again, it would just be about a 14-day course, and you'd want to give 220 milligrams once a day. And that is formulary on the VA, uh, so you could give that. And then you, if they do have a lot of uh, losses, a lot of uh, wound drainage, then you might want to repeat that 14-day periodically. But you wouldn't want to put them on zinc and leave them on it forever. Okay, so we want to identify, um, you know, the patients at nutrition risk. And... Um, some of you I recognize from the CLCs, and I know I get consults from you on a new admission that's at risk of pressure ulcer development. So I know you're doing your assessments and referring appropriately. But nursing is really the first line of defense. And it goes, it's not necessarily the RN who is the first line of defense, it's really our CNAs. Because our CNAs are the ones who are in there bathing and taking care of them. And, they're the ones who are going to, you know, should be trained to identify the first sign of redness, um, skin breakage, things like that. And they should be trained to let the nurse know what's going on with that individual. And then, um, you know, you do your, your skin rounds and your skin treatments um, and, you know, do a good job of putting that information in the chart. But, and this, of course, is for an inpatient uh, basis, but there's the nutrition risk screening. It's completed by the RN and the initial nursing assessment, and then you know it goes through if there if there's any problems, like if they're not eating, if they have trouble chewing. There's a lot of questions that you go through, and if there's yes to any of those, um, you know then you can put through a nutrition consult. Also, if the Braden score here, the one that you all do, if it's less than or equal to 18 or if the Braden nutritional subscore is of one or two, then you would want to put through a consult to the dietitian. And, um, you know, I don't really know how they do things at Audi versus the way they do things here, but I think it's pretty streamlined and it's, it should be the same process. Um, if you have a good relationship with the dietitian on your unit, and, you know, you may want to just talk to them and you wouldn't necessarily have to put a consult in as long as they're uh, receptive and they get to uh, addressing the needs of the resident in a timely manner. Um, so uh, the skin care bundle, I guess it's a, a paperwork that you all do if there's a skin problem uh, completed by the RN and then you put in the consult. So uh, is there any questions as far as 
how you do that process here at the VA? No, I, I know we have um, QM that monitors who, you know, who's on wounds and the whole process quite carefully. Okay, so nutrition assessment. Um, the RN or the physician can order a nutrition consult. So anybody who identifies a wound or somebody at increased risk of wound uh, formation can put through a nutrition consult. And the, the inpatient dietitian will assess the patient within 48 hours. And then of course on an outpatient basis, um, a little bit more time is allowed. And uh, you know, there's always the problems with getting them in or being able to contact them on an outpatient basis. Uh, in in home-based primary care, I do see some of the home-based primary care nurses. There's the dietitians with the home-based primary care also, so they can go in the home and they can assess to see how they're eating and if they're getting adequate calories, adequate protein. Um, they can recommend and implement special measures such as. Um, Meals on Wheels, that way you know that you know, protein's coming in on a regular basis with the meat that's provided with Meals on Wheels, plus they always give them milk every day. Um, also, they'll, they'll coordinate with the social worker and the case manager, which would be the RN, on if there's any special needs like providers, calling the family to help, you know, look, your dad really needs some extra help at this time. Is there any way you could go in and help him make breakfast or something of that nature? So we do need to make sure that at the, in the home setting that their nutritional needs are cared for also. It's so much easier in the, you know, if they're inpatient, you know, we can just add an extra here, there, or yonder. But even if they are inpatient, we want to make sure that they're eating the food that we're providing for them. We do have constraints in what we're able to provide. Um, you know, we don't have over easy eggs. <laughs> we don't have, you know, we have our scrambled eggs or our, our omelets, um, which may not be their favorite. But if they really refuse those, we, they, we have other things that we can go to. We can, we have cottage cheese, we have cheddar cheese, we have, you know, sausage. There's other things we can give for breakfast. Peanut butter to get a little bit more protein into them. As far as supplementation goes, it's really preferential instead of putting extra supplements on the meal tray to give it between meals. Because if you're giving a meal, a meal is usually um, six, seven hundred calories. And so if you put a 360 calorie supplement on top of that, are they really going to eat the entire meal plus drink that supplement? In some cases, yes. And if that's their preference, then we'll go for it. But it really isn't best practice to supplement the meals because a meal should stand alone. And if they need supplementation, it's best to give it between the meals. We have a lot of um, difficulty in making sure that that gets to the, the resident um, between meals. And so we need to work on implementing that in a better manner. But if somebody's at home, we really want to you know, if we do recommend that they take Insure or any type of a supplement, that it be given between meals. And that's often a really good tool if you have somebody in the home setting that has a wound, that they have, you know, their breakfast, lunch, supper, and then, um, you know, something in between or at bedtime, and really focus on the, the protein. Uh, Oftentimes, when somebody has a wound, that's when they kind of have a wake-up call and they say, oh, I need to eat better, I need to eat healthier. And invariably, they think eating healthier and better is to eat cereal, milk, and bananas for breakfast, <laughs> which isn't necessarily your highest in protein. So um, in the elderly, and, and since you know, wound healing is really the most important thing if they have a bad wound, we really don't want to limit their eggs, um, especially in the elderly. They really haven't proven that intake of eggs contributes to heart disease. Um, so we really want to encourage them to have their eggs. And if they're really uh, health conscious, then they could do the egg white. That would be perfectly fine. But the protein in the egg and the milk is the most complete protein in the 
best utilized by the human body. So we want to encourage those as much as possible. Now, if somebody's lactose-free, we have all the lactose-free milk products um, that we would want to recommend so that they don't have diarrhea. And then we would also, uh, you know, if but if somebody really doesn't like milk, then we have to, you know, work on, on other issues around the milk. But getting the, the protein in, the calories in, making sure they have enough water, making sure they have access to food. Do they have food in their home? Do they have somebody who's going to shop for them? Those are all factors that need to be looked into. So um, the, uh, the team approach, we want to uh, make sure that they're getting enough. We want to liberalize their diets as much as possible. So if you see anybody in an institutional setting that's on a uh, 1,800 calorie, 2 gram sodium, Coumadin, uh, let's see, low potassium, uh, 1,500 calorie fluid, or 1,500 cc fluid restriction. Um, have any of you ever eaten any of that? <laughs> um, it really is not very palatable. So, uh, you know, true, if somebody has heart failure, we need to try to limit the salt as much as possible. But in many cases, with some adjustment in, in medications, we can, the, the goal is for the food to go in the mouth and be utilized by the body. If the, mouth, the, the food's not going in the mouth, we need to modify the diet to where they're going to eat it. And this goes with consistency also. If somebody really is going to go on a hunger strike because they don't want pureed food and honey thick and liquids, then we really need to um, get the speech therapist and the fish physician involved in getting the diet order modified to foods that they will actually eat. Um, so it is a team approach. Everybody needs to look at their different um, perspective of looking at something. Um, our, our, uh, in home-based primary care, we have um, Dr. Clu, who is very <coughs> instrumental on showing us that everybody looks at something with a different lens. So nursing looks at it from one view, dietary from another, the physician from another, speech therapy, occupational therapy, um, the, wound, the wound nurse. So everybody needs to look at it from their specialty and make the appropriate recommendations for the best benefit of the patient. So um, again, adequate calories, protein, um, we want to make sure that they're not losing weight. We want to make sure they're not gaining too much weight. If they are, we need to cut back on supplements or you know some foods that they're taking in that maybe aren't providing them benefit. Uh, we want to make sure that they're getting their micronutrients if they may be deficient. And um, if they're in the home setting, that they have adequate food, somebody's helping them to eat, and all those factors. So is there any questions? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. My mother lived to be 96 years old, and I would say the last 10 years of her life, she didn't want me, period. And it was very, very hard to get her to eat anything, and we tried everything in the world. And yes, she did have eggs, and yes, she did have milk, but uh, nothing else, really, other than vegetables. And carbs. Carbs were her main thing. She wanted to have carbs. She said it was easier to digest. She couldn't digest the meat. You know, uh, she would drink milk, but she wouldn't eat ice cream. She wanted Mallory. She never got a wound, but if she would have had a wound, how would we have dealt with that? Well, probably you would have done more of the eggs and the milk. Um, and, and in those cases, you can make custard, you can make puddings, you can add non-fat dry milk to the, you know, the instant puddings. Um, so there's a lot of things to increase the protein in those foods. Um, but 
when an elderly person is not wanting to eat meat, then you have to look a little further into why that might be. Now, I've seen a number of elderly where it kind of upsets their stomach, and so they want to stay away from, say, more of the red meats, but maybe they'll eat fish, or maybe they'll eat chicken, or maybe that's the difficulty chewing. You know, are they, do they need some dental work done? Is it because when they chew, it's, you know, some pain is occurring in their mouth? So we need to look at all those factors. And in some cases, they can't really chew, but they don't like the meat in uh, the ground state. Or, uh, but then there's some things that are kind of naturally in the pureed state. Like you could go to more like chicken salads and you know grind it really fine, put it with mayonnaise and flavorings and make it into a sandwich. Or egg salad sandwiches or pimento cheese are usually favorites of older people. Or um, I, 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 I really have never had them myself, but the Vienna sausages and the potted meats, uh, the liverwurst, you know, things like that are naturally more pureed. And if we're really focusing on protein and not necessarily the other aspects, um, you know, those kinds of things can be used. Because again, we want to make sure that the food actually goes in the body. And those types of things would be more in the home setting than in the institutional setting. She didn't have a problem with the consistency of the meat or chewing the meat. Her problem was with digestion. Yeah, and, and that, and if they decide they're not going to eat it, then you just, eat, and really, you know, they can get enough protein with the eggs and the milk often. Um, quiches and um, again the sandwiches are usually easy and it's really difficult for them to prepare things like quiches so that would be brought in by family members or something like that. Yes ma'am? Well I just have a question there's a lot of uh, people who are younger too that uh, might have problems chewing because they need dental work but then again you know uh, you have to it, it, it's a financial burden, and so they don't go see the doctor. Is there any uh, organizations or that you could re recommend something where we can direct them so that they can get the help, the dental work be seen, and they can afford it? Um, well, I know in the the um, here at the VA, we you know it's based uh, if they're an outpatient, it's based on service connection. If they're not 100% service connected, they don't have benefits. So what we do in home-based primary care is we refer to the social worker, and the social worker usually has a list of low, um, you know, providers that provide a reduced cost service. And um, uh, in San Antonio, they have the dental school there, and you can get in there often. It's a long waiting list, but it, it's quite reasonable. And then they also have quite a bit, quite a long list of providers who will provide services at reduced rates. Now, in working with the home-based care uh, social worker here in Kerrville, we have less services here. Um, but that would be, it, the, best, the best avenue would be to go to the social worker in the clinic um, that you're working with. In Kerrville. The Salvation Army, I think it's once a month clinic. It's like a first come, first serve, but you can you can contact the local uh, Salvation Army and they will give you the information on their clinic, on their general clinic. Usually it's only for teeth. Yeah, but some of them, that's what they need. They can't eat because they have abscesses or whatever. They can't get dentures. No, you can't get dentures. But that, you may can get that through the dental school, but if it's an immediate need. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. And the dental school is good. It's just, you know, long wait to get in, and then it takes a lot of time. Um, you know, of course, the transportation to San Antonio up here in Kerrville. Any other questions? Thank you very much.
have given you all of my heart But there's someone who has torn it up 